Hello and welcome to the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm your host, Father Nathan, and it's a great joy today to be meeting a new friend all the way across the Pacific and into India. Today's guest is Sister Lucy Kudian, who I'm meeting for the first time. We've been talking for no more than five minutes as we get this podcast uh, squared away. So uh, I'm excited to get to know her a little bit and to introduce her to you in the process of it. At the end of Matthew's gospel, we're told by the risen Christ to go out to all the world and tell the good news. The good news that I'm most excited to remind people of is that they will survive their death, that death doesn't get to be the boss of them. Uh, it doesn't need to be the final word, that there's always a next opportunity to live abundantly, but let's start right now. Let's let's live a resurrected life this minute. So, uh, Sister Lucy, I have to tell you, my assistant Chantel is trying to get me before more people. And when she learned of you, she just kind of uh, threw her line in the water. <laughs> just <laughs> said, let's give this a try. And uh, she was so elated when somebody responded and said, yes, we'd love to. So uh, we're quite excited to have you as a guest today. Thank you so much. And I'm very humbled by that. That well, you found me and I am I'm really, really, very humbled. Uh, you have uh, uh, a little bit in your bio. You, you're a native of India and you were, grow you were educated from childhood and then somewhere around in your teen years moved to Mumbai? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, just a little bit of a traditional Catholic family. Yes. What we call it the call high school. Uh, we did not have any school anymore there in our village. So at that time, I moved to Bombay. Mm -hmm. And in Bombay, I saw the slums for the first time. The slums that you see in Bombay, you don't see it in Kerala where I was growing up, because we are in the village, you know, everybody has got their own little farm and their house, and then it goes on like that, but never a slum. And so I was really, really shocked to see the slum life of Bombay. Yes. And so at 14, that made a big impression on you, 14 or 15, somewhere along in there? Yeah. You know, during that time, because I, I was brought up in a very large family of nine children, and uh, so naturally, I was missing my siblings. I came across uh, Mother Teresa's home, which was very close to where I was staying. So I would run there just to play with the children. And eventually, I really fell in love with Mother Teresa's home. And I wanted to become my Mother Teresa's nun. So at the age of uh, 14, I saw uh, Mother Teresa from a very, uh, what you call, far distance. Yes. And uh, I understood, oh my God, this is the lady who has put all these things together. And I had great admiration. I decided to join Mother Teresa. And uh, so I went there and I told the sisters that I would like to join them. Uh, and they told me, no, you need to fill up a form and, you know, the usual thing of joining a religious order. And they said that you, those days we have to take the consent of my parents. So they gave me the form. I went with that form back to Kerala um, to get the signature. But at that time, my parents got a shock. And they said, where are you going? I said, to join Mother Teresa. I thought they would be happy. Yeah. But you know, they, they, my parents, it was the other way. They said, no way that you cannot go to Mother Teresa's home because what they had heard that Mother Teresa was picking up the leprosy patients. Uh -huh. so my so I was so concerned, you know, those days, uh, I'm talking about the, this was in 1972, uh, leprosy was really still considered as something that was very, very fearful. And so they said, nothing doing, you cannot join Mother Teresa. Uh -huh. So uh, I was very sad and um, I gave up the idea. Though it was uh, really burning in me, but I could not. I gave up the idea and I came back to Bombay to continue the job that I was doing. And what was that job? Uh, I was helping in the, with the, you know, I was with the sisters. I was helping in the house and plus in the school, the nursery school. Okay. 
Yeah. And then you joined a different yeah. religious order, is that right? Yeah, then I joined uh, later on when uh, about uh, at the age of 20, I found the order of the Sisters of the Cross of Shavanon. I met one sister and that sister explained to me what they do and things like that. And I was very excited. And uh, once again, I went home to inform my parents and I said, see, I'm joining the Holy Cross because there is no leprosy patients here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my parents, of course, as usual, especially my mother, she wouldn't allow. But this time I was so determined. My father was um, more or less okay because he was a very pious man in that sense, very church going. My mother too, but my mother had a different type of piety. She said, no more, to be a good person, you don't become, you don't have to become a nun, she said. Yeah. So, you know, but I don't know why I was so strongly drawn uh, and I really made up my mind so strongly that I'm going to be a nun. Okay. So I, I finally joined the Holy Cross. And were you able to join them without having a, a signature from your mother? Only my father had to sign. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it was okay. So my father quietly gave me the signature. That must have been an interesting uh, dynamic in their marriage for him to yeah. <laughs> yes. allow that. My mother, yeah. uh, my parents were both Catholic and very devout. And my dad had only two sisters and both became Dominican nuns. Uh, oh. They were both first grade teachers. They they both made their 75th anniversary of vows. They lived into their 90s as sisters. Uh, <laughs> but my and So my parents were very devout. But I, I went to a Presbyterian college after, after 12 years of Catholic school. And uh, I wasn't exactly sure whether I would stay Catholic because of uh, celibacy and, and not being able to marry. And my calling came more toward ministry first, Christian ministry, and then then I had to decide where that would happen and how it would happen. And so, um, but the, the only thing that my mother ever had to say was, please don't be a foreign missionary. Uh, and, <laughs> and if if I had done that, I, I'm sure she would have relented. She just didn't want to think that she would, you know, that I would live far, far away and she'd never see me again. Mm -hmm. or like that. But uh, I have no gift for languages at all. So uh, I've, I've taken five introductory Spanish courses and I still can barely... Uh, be be understood. So that really, I wasn't going to go anywhere where I had to learn another language anyway, and I, that was not my vocation. You you had this burning desire, uh, but then you couldn't join Mother Teresa's group. Did the Sisters of the Cross that you did were able to join? Did were you allowed to do that work right away, or did you need to do something else for some time? After I joined, the they had put me to look after the kitchen. Ah, so okay. Uh, I had I had no clue of cooking, but I learned uh, to do cooking from other sisters. And I was very happy to learn that, and I, I was very happy to cooking. I continued working there for nine years. Then later on, I decided, because, uh, you know, during the chapter of our congregation, there was, uh, um, I mean, uh, as a junior, I was voted uh, to join the uh, for the chapter. I was yeah. one of the Member, as a junior sister. Mm -hmm. So then during the chapter, uh, the option for the poor, that came uh -huh. up very strongly. And yes. I was very excited about it because that's what anywhere I wanted to do because the very fact that I wanted to join Mother Teresa because I wanted to work for this part of people and in the Holy Cross um, uh, congregation that I joined, I did not have that much opportunity. Okay, so I decided that, um, you know, option for the poor means I can do some social work, reach out to the poor, and things came to me strongly. So, and I saw one of our sister, she was already working in the village, and she was also present for the um, chapter. So I went and told her, you know, sister, I would like to join you because um, uh, you are doing such a good work. And she said, you are most welcome. I'm waiting for people like you. So then uh, it was not easy to get that permission through. You, you know, we are not allowed to choose what we like. You know, we are supposed to do what they tell us. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, I took the permission. Um, they gave me to, permission for two years. And they told me, okay, you are allowed to go. After that is after two or three years. You know, then uh, I was sent there to work with the system. I continued working there for nine years. 
uh, with the sister, I did not go back because nobody, anyway, they did not ask me to renew the contract. So I was very happy nobody asked me. And then in uh, 1991, a woman approached me asking for shelter. And it was not possible for me to give because uh, we are still living in a community like that. So I went to the superior and I said, sister, can we do something? And she said, no, you cannot do that because that woman was also seven months pregnant. And uh, I knew that she needed immediate shelter. I knew that her life was uh, being threatened. I had to be obedient. So I sent her back. And what happened was that that very night, her husband and she, they must have had some fight. And in that anger, he poured kerosene and set her on fire. Oh, my heavens. This lady was seven months pregnant. I heard the shouting and yelling because this happened to the slum where I was staying, very close. The just one road was separating us. I did not know it was the same woman who was yelling and other people also were shouting and things like that. So I ran there to see what was the, the noise all about. Sure. So when I was there, I realized this was the same woman and there she was shouting, you know, in our language, save me, in the sense of mujhe bachao, which means save me, save me, like that. And I was so shocked, you know, and with the help of the neighbors, I took the courage to take her to the nearby hospital. When I reached the hospital, doctor told me that she is already 90% burned. Oh. And, uh, we cannot do anything because it got very delayed because there was no cars. We never owned a car. We never had a rickshaw. And finally, we own, uh, we, I found a transport. By the time it took me quite a few hours just to reach up from the place where I was. Doctor told me, no, it is too late. We can't do anything. And since she was pregnant, I insisted doctor uh, to operate and let us take the baby out. But then uh, doctor told me it is no use. But, you know, I... I insisted. So finally, they operated on her. And uh, what I got in my hand was a fully burned baby. This incident completely shook my life once again. You know, I was so shocked with this because I felt so guilty for not reaching out to her on time. And this happened. So afraid to break the rules. And she died. That was my feeling at that time. Mm -hmm. And I have to do something about it. I would like to work for homeless people, there are so many people, because I used to see people begging on the street, women sleeping on the street, etc. And I, I felt that I have to do something, but I did not know what I'm supposed to do. So then when I told the sisters, they told me, Lucy, you don't know what you're asking for. I was very sad because they could not understand uh, what I was trying to tell them. Because what they told me is that, Lucy, this requires a lot of money, plus a lot of uh, work. For work, I was ready completely. How, whatever maybe I was ready to do. But where to find money was a big problem. I said, okay, I'm going. And I will do some things. Give me the permission. And I went to the other extreme. If the sisters had not given me the permission to move out, I wanted to leave the congregation. Before you go further, did you tell them that? Did you tell the sisters, if you don't give me permission, I'll do it anyway? Yeah, I had told them. All right. I did not uh, strongly push my way, but when it gentle way, I said, okay, sisters, if it is okay, then uh, I'm, uh, can I, will it be okay if I leave? So you were gentle about it? Yeah, very, very gentle. All right. And when the sisters knew that, uh, you know, I was so determined, then they gave me the permission. They told me that uh, you can go, but we will not give you any nuns to work with you. They told me there will be no money. So I said, then how to do? But still, I don't know from where the courage came. I said, okay. My sisters were very kind to me in that sense because they didn't tell me to get out from that house. I, I took help from, from my father. He's a Jesuit. I went to him. Then I told him about what my desire is. And so he said, Lucy, see, you, you will find help. Don't run away. Uh, you know, somehow, if your desire is strong, no, God will help you and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, And he also told me one sentence. He said, see, instead of running away, stay and do something for this type of women. He encouraged me. And uh, so I'm very grateful to uh, that priest um, for the encouragement that he had given me. 
because he told me if you have love for these people you'll find a way yes so believe it or not you know i i slowly found my way i was talking to people and i don't know why the people trusted me of course i was already working in the village and the people from the village started giving me money I came across an austrian person the same priest put me in touch with a priest with an um, uh, austrian uh, musician i can help you with some money uh, i can send you some money i was so grateful that i brought uh, a small piece of land in uh, 1993 uh, i started uh, putting up a structure small structure a small house i was able to move there only in uh, 1997 and i moved there with uh, just one woman and with two children and at present we have all <clears throat> over 1000 children and you know, more than other thousand women and homeless men are living with me in uh, 68 homes we have 68 68 homes here in uh, seven states of india that, that's wonderful you do, do you ever just look back at your life and say how in the world did this all happen when i look back what i say is uh, you know it's not what how much we do what more can be done Yes. Well, uh, that is my focus. Yes. How do you uh, I I support a uh a uh, ministry that does similar work but I but they don't allow any drug or alcohol use at all. People can't come onto the compound. They have drug or alcohol problems and in the United States many of the people yes. who are unhoused have addiction. How do you how yes. how, how did your your uh, organization and uh, uh work with that problem or was that a problem yeah uh, we do have people who have been alcoholic but you know they are so bad condition when i pick them up from the street that nobody asked me to go back to that same thing nobody worried me for alcohol as such they may they don't even uh, say to me that we want alcohol sometimes they may just run away it's uh-huh. okay uh uh-huh. people want to go away sometimes especially with men you know i find it difficult uh, because um, naturally they want women they want uh, men things like that do happen uh, but uh, if they want to leave the place they are most welcome to leave but Actually. majority of these people they don't leave me like that because they have found a home they found food and shelter and then those who can work we find some jobs for them uh uh-huh. they are happy with that yes good and sometimes when i give them money uh, they go back to alcoholism if that happens then i cannot keep them any more in our house mm-hmm. if they come drunk or anything then i tell them that you have to leave the place because other people also will get tempted you have some houses that are just for persons with mental illness uh how did that grow how did how did you move in that direction the so many of the women they are really on the street because they are mentally Ill, mentally ill we give them treatment and if they get all right and if they can give me the address of their home we reach them back home to find their home then we look after them for life long i say all right yeah. so we have you know houses for mentally challenged those i mean mentally, those who are born like that no and yeah. for mentally disturbed aged people who have no one to take care so we have the uh, different programs for different categories of women and also for men the similar way and then we have children now nearly 1000 children we have uh, these children are also either they are orphans or semi orphans or sometimes they have both the parents but they are separated uh, they are unfit parents uh, to take care of the children so the government sent them to us you know the title of my little podcast is the joyful friar that's that's not yeah. me that's saint dominic our founder that was his nickname um so i don't didn't want to appropriate that to myself and assume it but but it challenges me to be joyful uh whether i'm having a happy day or not but, yeah. um, because i you know how the how christian people will call good friday good it just takes a lot of nerve to uh to call good friday good i think uh tell me about joy in your life what has given you uh the most joy well for me you know 
I think every day is a joyful day because the type of that work that I'm doing give me personally a lot of satisfaction. To see a woman who is begging on the street, uh, to, to, today she's taking the mic and speaking. You know, like uh, today uh, we had a youth camp for the children. Okay, so uh, the way the children were taking the mic and speaking, and I know what is the background of the children. Yes. Okay, what they have went to, what they have been suffering, and today what they have achieved in their life, you know, that gives us so much of joy. You yeah. know, a child who was a beggar, today he's an engineer. A, a child who was not wanted by nobody, four of them have reached the US. They got jobs there. You know, like uh, uh, two of them just traveled to um, Germany to be a volunteer. You know, what more joy? You know, it gives me every day this. It's not that uh, we don't have um, uh, the pains, but you know, why look at only the pains all the time? I look at the positive aspects of it. When the youth are there with us, they will give us little trouble, but I feel uh, that is nothing compared to the joy that we have, uh, like um, to see what's going on day to day. Mm. A woman who was not wanted by anyone, today she is so well. So what more joy than that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Even for a man, okay? Uh, like he did not know, he, he was an alcoholic, hopeless life he lived. And today he is with Maher, uh, leading a very joyful life and that gives so much of satisfaction and when they tell me uh, you know joining their hands and they tell me Didi, you know I can't even imagine what life I led um, and now what my life has become you know when we see hear all this what more joy there um, uh, I think the best I don't know how to express my English is not good um, because I studied in Malayalam medium, so it's so difficult to express my uh, uh, what what the, the the satisfaction joy I have in working with these people. I don't speak any other language, and I'm understanding you perfectly. <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> that young girl at 15 who moved to Bombay and saw all that uh, destitution and and uh, slums and everything. It sounds like at now you're 67 as i am it sounds like you you've accomplished some of what you set out to do you, uh, there's still yeah. always more work to do but it must be very satisfying to go i i've done something ah uh, yeah but uh, i have you know for me um it's not i have done we have done yes okay full credit to my staff who are doing this because if it was not for them, uh, the committed staff that I have, I would not have achieved what we are doing today. Yeah. So uh, my full uh, the credit I give to the staff who are doing the work day to day. Well, I don't know if you think of yourself as a foundress in the tradition of foundresses in religious life and so on, but you yeah. certainly you brought into existence an uh, organization that didn't exist because you helped give birth to it, do you feel like it's, uh, that it's ready to work without you? Should you die and, and leave it? Do you, do you feel like you've created something that will survive you? Um, the organization that made me to survive, you mean? Yeah, and the ministry, the work, uh, do you feel yes. like, um, uh, it, one of the, one of the um, issues in organizational theory is when, when founders leave or die that sometimes the organization doesn't go on very well do you feel like uh, the that you put in place uh a system that will or and good people and and all of that that will survive you yes uh it, surely it will survive because um, we have put in a lot of sy sy system inside so that you know the people who come after me or sit on my chair will know how to take it forward yes. it's very and what happens is that because of the houses that I have started in different houses, different states, mm -hmm. all they know what we are doing, how to do, how to take it forward. Yes. 
Of course, uh, there will be any, when any foundress dies, there will be a little bit of um, um, what you call unrest or uh, insect. Yeah. There might be a feel, little bit. Like um, um, supposing a mother dies of a family, what happens? You know, something like that. But yeah. I see, you know, uh, the things will move on. Uh, um, that my innermost being tells me everything will be fine. Yes. Uh, what, because, have, what have you not done that you still want to do? Uh, I want to work more uh, uh, for transgender because in India, uh, we have no choice but go and beg. Okay? So one I of the I didn't understand that word. Oh, you, we have no choice but... Beg. Beg, okay. Yeah, because uh -huh. these people are thrown out from the family and yeah. nobody accepts them. So what happens that we at every uh, signals and every um, street, we find these people begging because that's the only choice left for them. Yeah. And there's a lot of violence among them. And, uh, you know, because people have not accepted them to be yeah. what they are. You know? uh, so uh, the society has rejected the, the you know, the, the difference. So because of that, they have become very aggressive. So we get them to be aggressive. It's not that they were born aggressive. So yeah. what happens is that whenever I look at them, I have a dream to create a home for them. Because in the beginning, when I was beginning a home, there were two people who came here and they told me, Didi, we have no way to go. But then I had created homes for men and a home for women. But then where will I put this one, the third gender? Uh, I had no place because they were uh, what you call, um, supposing it was a male, they were with a female dressing. So yeah. the people will not accept. So I did not know where to put them. And I told them, I will see later. I, was, I did not um, say, it. I just said just now, I don't have place. But, you know, it is working in my mind very seriously that I want to do create a home for them before yeah. anything happens to me. That's my big dream. Good for you. Good for you. Um, yeah. what, your, I understand that in your, um, in your houses and throughout your ministry that you, it's, it's clear that you come from the Catholic Christian tradition, but you try to uh, live that out in the broadest possible way and, and be inclusive of people of different faiths or no faith. Can you tell us a little yeah. about that? Yeah. When I started the, the project, you know, the project is called Maher, which means mother's home in our local language. So when I started this, one thing I kept in mind, and that is to work for people and not for any particular religion as such. The teachings of Jesus was deep in my heart because what Jesus said, love one another. He did not say you love the Christians or things like that. You know, so all these things is to confuse me. And I used to think very deeply about it. And so I did not want any particular religion to come into the uh, homes of Maher. So I, I kept the holy books of every religion, not every religion, but whichever we could find. Okay. And also we have uh, the symbols of all religion in our homes. So when we are sitting to pray, we pray to the divine, to the divine energy or the divine light, or you can say to God, not taking any name of any particular religion. Mm -hmm. So all our songs that we sing, the prayers that we say, everything is addressed to God, but we pray to the divine. Mm -hmm. not any particular uh, thing. At the same time, we have meditation, we have yoga, we have uh, every day we have prayer and meditation in the house. In the evening and in the morning, maybe about 10 minutes if it is for children and if it is for adults, it is little longer. So it depends. And uh, But if you come during Christmas, you may think that I converted all into Christianity. That's not true. <laughs> And if you come during Diwali, you may think that all are Hindus. And if you come Eid, you may think that all are Muslims. You know the way our children dress, they, they will put the burqa maybe or tie the shawl and, you know, to be 
in solidarity with all of them. It's just like that. It's not, um, uh, you know, we have converted or anything like that. But of course, um, very often we have this interfaith um, gathering and different religion people will speak about it, what we are doing, what we believe in and all that. So the children all know what is Hinduism. They will know what is Christianity. The, our children will know what is um, Islam, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. The main religions of India. Love and respect everyone mm -hmm. without uh, neglecting anybody. Yes. But at the same time, worshipping the divine. Okay. Well, you must be about to do something for... Uh... Holy Week and Easter then, what does that look like in your houses? Yeah, uh, normally like uh, Monday, Thursday, the, we have the washing of the feet. You know, what I do is washing of the feet is uh, like we have a, we, I explain to them why Jesus did that, things like that. And, you know, it's would, like, would you describe that a little more? Because my audience is not all Christian either, and they might not, not know what you're talking about, the washing of the feet. Yeah. Uh, what I mean is, uh, you know, like service. For me, it was that. So for me, all these people who are uh, uh, working for the homeless people, I go around to wash the feet of those people, no matter what religion we belong to. Yeah. So even tomorrow, uh, like we will be having like uh, one and a half, two hours of prayer um, uh, because we are having the meeting. And soon after that, this is the Holy Week, you know, we yeah. consider it, the, we call it the Holy Week. So um, to remind everyone, we have to be in solidarity with the Christians and the Muslims who are going to celebrate the Eid. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also in Hinduism, there is a feast coming up. So to keep up to three religion, we will be having a prayer. And then um, uh, on next day, it is only a day of prayer, fasting and praying. To remind how Jesus became humble. Mm -hmm. Though he was so, I mean, we consider him God. But what was there for him? He he was washing the feet. Then why can't I do it? Yes. When, uh, he did not uh, think of who was that person. You know, he had uh, he went around washing the uh, feet of his disciples. And how what humble people they were. Yes. And why can't I do the same? That is what I think. When Pope Francis uh, washed the feet for the first time as Pope, he shocked people yeah. by going to a prison and washing the feet of the feet men of and women and uh, Muslims, and, and they were prisoners. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're, uh, it sounds like what you're doing is very much like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very meaningful prayer service that we have. And um, um, those who want to fast on Good Friday, they're allowed, but it is not compulsory, even for the children. We just keep some biscuits and... Um, things lay for children. And if they want to fast, they can fast. So if they want to eat that, they can eat. You know, it's like that. The freedom is given. It's not anything that is compulsory. Yes. Have you had any pushback from organized religion, either Catholic or Hindu or Muslim? Do you have religious leaders telling you to stop what you're doing or anything like that? Uh, yes. Uh, in the beginning, um, um, there were some people who came to ask me, Lucy, does canon law allows you to do this because you are a Catholic nun and you have not kept, uh, yeah, because, you know, I don't know if you know, can notice, this is uh, my medal. I have removed my cross and I have put um, a medal that is uh, of all religion. The, this is all like uh, the symbols of all religion. Mm -hmm. On this medal, to me, it and looks like a flower. It has a it has a circle in the center, and it looks yeah. like it has six petals. But it is the symbols of all religion there. Okay. And um, uh, in the in a real picture, there is a little light that is burning, which means all the religions are around, and all religion is teaching us to go to God or go to the divine. 
that's the meaning and i have also that medal i removed my cross uh, and, and i started wearing this so at that time um, naturally uh, some of the nuns and the priests they came and asked me you see don't you think uh, that uh, you are breaking all the rules and uh, they were also a little bit upset with me does this canon law allow i said i'm not educated to know that and i i know law allows but i don't know whether the canon law what what it says i said hmm. so then they went back okay. uh, you know the the other place the when i started working uh, the Hin hindu community thought that i had come for conversion so they also troubled me a lot Uh, but you know, I made it very clear to them. I said, "No, I am not here. I have just come here to love and serve people." Okay, so they could not understand. So the trouble went on for very long time, and um, um, after some time, people started understanding me. Also, what happened? People misunderstood me more because I couldn't speak the local language. Ah, oh. uh, you know, uh, I I speak Malayalam. That is my mother tongue and i knew little english because um, i picked up english with the children later on in the school but um, i did not know the local language that's marathi nor hindi so it was very very difficult for me to express myself to people i'm not come here for conversion but just to work so yeah. the people just understood me they came to kill me they spat on me and lots of things happened in the beginning Uh, but slowly slowly the misunderstanding and as clear but whenever i go and open a home in a new place people always think we are come for conversion mm -hmm. yes uh, uh, pope francis spoke about that do you remember that interview he had with an atheist reporter in the first few months of his papacy mm -hmm. and people assumed or i guess this atheist reporter warned it was warned by his friends he's going to try to convert you And and the man said, no, no, that's not at all true. We were just two human beings having a good conversation, and yeah. uh, that's and Pope Francis said something like that. He said that's just disrespectful to to go into a conversation with another person with the intent to make them but change. <laughs> we're all free to be who and what we want to be. Yes. You know, the, the the odd ministry that I've been given in, in the last two decades involves people who've already died uh, and and who died violently. And some some they're upset in the afterlife and they come to me in a dream and show me and and then it involves talking with them. And so some people automatically think that that's the devil's work. It's forbidden and, <laughs> and so on. And so I've had a little bit of that, but fortunately, not very much. I've been free to the the, the Easter proclamation of, of Christians is he is risen. He died horribly, but he's risen. And uh, you're doing a work where people can look at the horrible circumstance that they used to live in. Or you were even talking earlier about the the joy that you feel when you see somebody and you know their their circumstance, their backstory, and they're at a microphone giving a talk or <laughs> they're going to Germany to do service. You've seen resurrection right before your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing, you know, like um, one of the incident I remember, uh, like when I started, uh, uh, you know, I had kept the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, you know, uh, on in a prayer sanctuary, and uh, one priest who was visiting me said, "Lucy, I appreciate all your work, but um, this hurts me a lot that." Um, You have kept the Quran, the Bible, and the Bhagavad Gita all on the at the same place. You know, like uh, he felt that the Bible should have been in the middle, the or <laughs> what he felt on the top, or something like that. Yeah. So I so that means you believe in different God. I thought there was only one God. You know, so when I told him like that, then he did not know what to answer me. You know, in a very simple and very loving way, I told him there's yeah. only. God and you read different uh, the spirituality and somebody else is reading the same, but it is all leading there. So why are we uh, thinking of this way? I said. Then well, it's clear that you're a gentlewoman, and being angry about such things doesn't help anybody. <laughs> no, no, I have never been angry because you know I understand from where it is coming. 
uh, it uh, why to get angry it is uh, it is it's sheer ignorance of what they believe in mm. you know because we never went beyond uh, reading the bible now what deep into reading the bible if you are really in love with jesus we would have seen what jesus believed in yes and okay. i i make the point that a, a lot of i have so many people that find me online now i mean look at us we're talking from the united states and india uh, over zoom and zoom is not that complicated even for people who think they don't know they they'll break a computer if they touch it uh it's not that hard uh, and many people especially during the pandemic were all alone even if they had a house of worship it was locked up because it was unsafe to go there uh but now yeah. they're lots of people are looking online for religious or spiritual support and many of them at least the ones that were raised christian many of them are afraid of jesus because they've been told he will judge them and he's angry at them or whatever and uh <laughs> i just have never believed that I, I i it's not that i wasn't taught it but it just never made sense that god yeah. that jesus was out to punish me or to convict me of something he just loves me that's all yes and uh, you know like whenever people tells me like that they told me lucy you will be severely punished i said i don't punish i don't believe in the punishment after death i believe in here and now and i'm happy so i don't believe in that kind of uh, kind of thing what you believe in of course everything i tell them in a very gentle way without hurting them yeah i don't hurt their beliefs system let them believe in whatever they feel comfortable you know their fear could never overcome me you know, see i believe in a religion which has no i believe in a fearless religion not um, uh, saying that we will go to hell or the thing i said i don't believe in that i only believe in the um in one loving god and that's it then they said oh that means you are allowed to do anything i said when when i believe in the loving god i will never do anything that is wrong yes because i don't want to hurt I, people i only want yes. to love yeah yes they you know they, mostly it is the religious and priests who would question me and sometimes the lay people who comes to maher uh, they said we cannot help you because um uh you have kept like uh, you know um, because i they i have got the pictures of buddha the picture of uh, jesus the picture of ganesh you know the god ganesh in india yes. mm -hmm. so so they feel little bit shaken up by what i have kept on my altar so you know i said see they are very comfortable in calling god in that name and i am comfortable calling god in uh, uh, in the name of jesus so you call whatever you want but for me i am comfortable like this there was a, one time i was uh, i had gone to us to raise funds and i was really really very badly in um, need of money and uh, i met one uh, my uncle took me to one priest i had an uncle in us and he took me to a priest uh, he is a catholic priest and uh, you know he was um, a very very fine man and but his whole you know understanding was that uh, uh, we should distribute bible to people mm -hmm. okay? so i listened to everything and he said lucy i have big amount so you and then i told the father i said no i'm not working for that because uh, my my thing is to see the body and soul of the people are kept together not like this i don't want to teach a bible because my people are coming from every faith and it's injustice that i teach them my way of believing let them believe what they do. then she said no 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 but then he understood the work that i'm doing is very genuine and he told me lucy do do one thing uh, you know which of these americans will come to see whether you are uh, teaching the bible or not you distribute the bible and at the end of the year you give me a report saying that uh, so many bibles were distributed and um, uh, you know that you had taught bible so i turned round and i told father i'm very sorry i cannot write a report like this which i have not done i can only write the report that is what i have done 
and I will never distribute Bible and I will never teach Bible. Uh, I said, I teach Bible in a very different way, by way of, way of life, but not this way, I said. So yeah. I'm sorry, I don't want. He yeah. was feeling so sad that, you know, he had so much money, but he could not part with that money unless I was teaching Bible. So, you know, sometimes I have to refuse. I knew people, my people were starving here for money. I mean, for starving here for food, but I could not accept that money. I understand. I've also run nonprofits my whole life, and sometimes it's involved large-scale fundraising, and it's just not right to let someone with a lot of money dictate the mission. The, yeah. the mission is given us, I think, by the Holy Spirit, and it's not up to someone with money to buy a part of it and say, you, you'll only get my money if you do it my way. Even if they're, yes. they, as you say, they're, they can be very genuine and sincere, and you just have yeah. to politely say, um, your your generosity is misplaced here. There's there's certainly there's a right place for it. This is just not it. We're not the right fit. Yeah. Yeah. And during a tsunami, I really experienced so many miracles because you know um, we were cooking and distributing food to the people who were walking back home. Plus we were distributing uh, to thousands of people uh, food grain. We were giving shelter for the people who were affected with the corona, and everybody was afraid what I was doing. But you know, when the divine energy is working, I can tell you, none of us got corona. And we worked so closely with the people, nothing happened. It's not that uh, the thing, of course, we had taken precaution. Yes. How to take, keep the distance, and things like that. We followed all that, but we continuously worked. And everybody thought my, uh, you know, my money will get over. But you won't believe when people saw what I'm doing, people send me more and more money. And I never run short of that money those days. But the, now I run short of money because now with the corona, people lost job and uh, lots of people are working from home and things like that. So they don't have that much funds. And so, uh, but not during corona. During corona, I received a lot of money. Mm. I was working for people. Well, I know that you're not doing a fundraising video with me today, but I'm yeah, at least, yeah. I'm at least uh, putting your name and your mission out there in front of my audience. And af as we conclude, the show notes will have ways that people can be in touch with you and support your mission if they choose to. Yeah. You know, in all our work, what we are trying to see is that though at the moment, I am very busy opening homes for people and looking out to the people. But what, what I am also dreaming is that for India is that how we will not have homes like Maher. And yeah. towards that, we work a lot. Okay. And um, what I think is, uh, you know, I don't know whether you have read about this thing. What, what I have put is love is my religion. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, so I, I don't. Uh, I don't know how you call it uh, in the other religion, what you believe in. I believe in the Bible very strongly and that I believe in love. Mm. That's it, yeah. Well, I use, I'm a preacher, so words are really important to me. And, and mm -hmm. I only speak English, but in English, believe and beloved are the same root word. Yeah. So to believe for me is inseparable from knowing that I'm loved. I believe in my beloved. And I, I believe that, the, that my beloved created everyone and everything, and is loving everyone and everything always. And all I really need to do is uh, get out of the way. All I really need to do <laughs> is allow myself to be loved, uh, try to magnify that love. I love the way, you know, that in the story of, of Mary, who's pregnant, visiting her cousin Elizabeth, who's also pregnant, all she has to do is walk in the door and she blesses the place without saying anything. It, her presence is the blessing. And, and But when she does speak, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And I like that idea that I can receive love, magnify love, and give love. And you can do that on your deathbed. <laughs> you can do that on a good day or a bad day. You, you can always receive love, magnify love, give love. And it's quite clear that you're doing that on a grand scale. 
Thank you so much, Father Nathan. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. you so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Joyful Friar. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can make a donation by clicking the donate button. See you next time. God bless.